everybody wait, 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 hey, be, be patient, wait, almost, om, almost, almost there, and now Casemiro is back on side. This is the Arsenal Vision post-match podcast. My name is Alex Smith, me on Twitter, ain't gonna, not on side, you know what I mean, holding his defensive line. Um, I think he's just about made it back to the defensive line. Um, I Look, I don't usually do this. I don't usually make it about me. I'm going to make it about me today. I want an apology from everybody. I want an apology from everybody who accused me of jinxing this game. I told you it would be easy, and it was as easy as could be, stress-free, no pro. Okay, so maybe, maybe, maybe it was a little harder than we wanted, but it is victory at Old Trafford. It is the most wins we've had in the Premier League era. It is our largest goal difference in history. We are on course to hit 89 points, second only to the Invincibles, and we push the title to the final day. Whatever happens, whatever happens, we get a final day where it is all up for grabs. And that, I think, in the era of Manchester City is just about as much as you can ask for. I'm really excited for it, obviously. Um, we'll be in London at the tail end of this week. We've got our event at the Ali Pali Theater. I can't wait to see so many people. There'll be get-togethers and patron meetups and regular meetups. And, um, you know, I might... I don't want to. I don't want to get crazy, but I might have a cocktail. Like it's gonna be, it's gonna be a uh, a fantastic weekend. And who knows? Maybe, maybe, maybe there will be some adjustments to itineraries to to be there for a parade. But we we don't want to get ahead of ourselves. I'm not saying that's the expectation. That's the hope. Obviously, there are instant reactions. Our instant reactions now um in, include video and are done live. So if you're like, I want it instant, it's literally instant. It starts about five minutes after. Uh, the final whistle goes and we do it live and then you get an audio version as well. I just heard Tim and Clive saying they are going to do a pod for you in the next day or two. So you'll have that. We'll have some fun stuff uh, from when we're all together uh, that we'll be recording, which will be cool at the tail end of this week. So lots of good stuff to happen. And I look, I'm not going to sit here and say, come on, you Spurs on this Arsenal podcast, but well, I just said it. And you know what? I stand by it. And let's face it. Nothing would be Spursier than Spurs winning the one game they don't want to win um, to help Arsenal win the title. And we probably need to root for Liverpool today if we're doing the galactic calculus, right? If we're if we're tying ourselves in knots, because if Villa drop points, then Spurs really do have something to fight for on Tuesday. But we are here to talk about United and about a season that goes down to the wire. And we're here to do that with Clive. You can find him on Twitter at Clive PFC. Hello, Clive. Hello, hello. And Tim, you can find him on Twitter at Stoneman. Hello, Tim. Hello there. Good to see you, friends. It'll be fun to see you not in these little recording windows, but in person very soon. Um, this is a hard game. And this is a hard game for a simple reason. It has all the joy of victory. It has all the joy of pushing the title to the final day. It has all the joy of beating a hated rival at a stadium that has been a house of horrors for us. And yet, I don't think there's any honest Arsenal fan that would say it was the performance that they were hoping for or even expected when they saw the lineups come out. And so, I'm going to warn you, we're going to do the elation part. We're going to do the celebration part. But when we get into the game, I don't think there's a hell of a lot to say that's that's effervescent in praise. But we're, we're going to do what we can. We're going to do what we can to make it fun and enjoyable while acknowledging that maybe, just maybe, we played a bit within ourselves. But it is victory at Old Trafford. And I guess I will start with you, Tim. You've been there an awful lot of times. We've seen an awful lot of bad United teams. <laughs> it, it is the case that we are so good and they are so crap that maybe we wanted something more emphatic. In a way, it's almost like the North London Derby. At 3-0, we, we had dreams of a humiliation dancing in our head. And because we didn't get it, there was almost frustration at the whistle. But in these fixtures, you have to take the result. The result is paramount. And we needed it to push it to the final day. I think more than losing to this United team, to be this close to at least getting it to the final day and not getting it there would have been gutting. So as someone who's done a lot of these trips, not seen a lot of joy at the end of them, <laughs> how were you feeling despite, you know, performance aside, just the joy of doing this and sending it to the final day? Yeah, I, I mean, I have actually seen us win the league there, but it feels like we've That's been crazy, playing yeah. for it ever since. <laughs> it feels like we did some kind of deal where it's like, okay, you can win the league there, but the next 20 years are going to be shy. Because <laughs> um, I've seen us lose 6-1 and 8-2 there as well. Um, yeah, I mean, it, this is such a difficult game to pass, and I knew it would be. Um you know, I, I, everything you said in the build-up to this game, Elliot, was was quite accurate, I think. Mm -hmm. But 
the the thing me and my friends were saying uh kind of on the way home was like if this game had been a week ago two weeks ago three weeks ago i think we would have let them have it but i just think with one like with one game left and with city having coasted against um you know flip flop clad fulham on saturday morning like the, i think there was so much tension on this game and and it was relief at the final whistle there was just so much relief and the joy took a while it felt i think you're right to draw a comparison to the spurs game because I was angry at the final whistle of the Spurs game. I was like, mm. why have you put me through this? This was so unnecessary. And yeah, I, I think that any other point in the season, this game, we would have let them have it. Um, but but yeah, like it, you you just, we had to get it over the line. And it's it's quite weird as well, because we we're on the tram to the game and the United lineup dropped and none of their players were even in the squad that, that I thought would come back in. And mm. on one hand, that puts you under even more pressure <laughs> yep. because you're like, this is a really crap United team. But at the end of the day, that's really what get, gets us the result because Casemiro being at centre-back instead of Lissandro Martinez. I mean, Lissandro Martinez could have been on crutches and I don't think he'd be playing Havertz on side for that first goal. And the, the pressure we invited in like the whole second half, really, if they have Fernandes and Rashford, you know, like they just didn't have the quality. They had no quality whatsoever going forward. And um, even one of those players had been available. I think they could have punished us. So in the end, the fact that United kind of held those players back because I think they want to play them on the last game, ease them into the cup final and all of that. So but perhaps this game did come at a useful juncture in that respect. I think if we'd been a bit closer to the FA Cup final, some of those guys might have played, but... Yeah, look, not a classic performance at all. I got very, very tetchy. I was shouting a lot in that last half an hour. You know, I was I was a little bit beside myself. It was I felt a bit ragged. I felt like the pressure was getting to me. Um, but it, like, I'm sorry, cliche alert. At this point of the season, I just don't think it matters. All that matters is the result, and I'm so so happy this goes to the final day for me. Such a big target in my mind get it to the final day don't let Tottenham win them the league and have them like you know listen they'll probably roll over and lose and it will contribute but that thought as well that it could be done at Spurs on Tuesday night that also scared me a bit so I'm very relieved to not have that and I'm just really looking forward to next Sunday now because I don't think the pressure is going to be on us unless City lose tomorrow which I don't think they will and I'm just going to try and enjoy it um, for all it's worth, because I think the team have been outstanding. And I have the same feeling going into this game that I did last season, where I wanted to celebrate and appreciate the team. And I'm, I'm fully intending to do that again on Sunday, but with something on the line as well. Yeah, and, and that's the thing. In September, in August, in October, in November, you're analyzing games not only through the lens of the performance, but through the lens of are we the team we think we are? Are we really good? What can we fix to be even better? Because you have big aspirations and you're on the march to get there. By the end of the season, as you're crawling over the finish line, I think all you're trying to do is accumulate points, right? Um, and especially in these big rivalry games and especially away, I think you have to be able to set aside the expectation of swashbuckling football and, and just accept that the points are what matter. Frankly, you know, we are going to get into this as the pod progresses, but one of the reasons we've been so good away from home is because away from home, our defense has been a bedrock on which we've built, you know, a, a really incredible accumulation of points away from home. So, Clive, but sticking with the theme of, of the emotion, this game did, I'll admit, put me through the ringer a bit, but it was a weird one because I experienced frustration that we weren't playing our football. I experienced the joy that we were ahead, but I experienced the worry that we... We were still potentially going to be victimized by some kind of late heroics from players I'd never heard of, or even Anthony, who I probably should never have heard of. Um, it, it obviously never came. It was sort of like the Spurs game in a way, because I, I thought about turning it off with five minutes ago and said, you know what, I'll just find out the score. Obviously, I didn't do that. But the interesting thing is, there's also the reality that they just created very little. So all this anxiety was building up 
despite there not being much from United to generate it, it was kind of like when little brother attacks big brother and big brother puts his hand on his forehead. You know what I mean? In the, in the cartoons or whatever. And he's just swinging, but he can't reach you. So how about you? How do you experience it emotionally? Were you racked with the same kind of anxiety that, that maybe the Darby gave us? Did it feel comfortable to you at full time? Was it more of a, well, thank God, or did you really get the full joy of victory? Cause I, if I'm being honest, just for me, I think it was a more of a, well, thank God we got away with that. And, and that maybe the joy started to come a little bit later. Yeah, I suppose you, if you dig into why you felt like that, because I think most of us felt like a sense of relief. And I think it's just due to all the things that maybe Tim's outlined, some of the things that could happen. You don't want to be going to Spurs on Tuesday night and flag-waving Spurs. Can you, can you imagine it? Then winning the title there? This sort of stuff that lasts for decades in your life. You know, you can't. so you can't have that. We spent the last year being told we're bottlers. And 2024, I think we've won 15 out of 17 games, drew at City, lost against Villa, whatever it is. And so we know we're not bottlers anymore. We've got better. But if we lose there, then we're open to all of that again, aren't we? Versus the worst Man United yep. team. And so I think it's more what could have happened versus the actuals. The actuals, if you look at this game again, Elliot, and I, I went to click rewatch this morning, but it was so poor, I couldn't actually click it. <laughs> so I went to click it. And um, <laughs> but if we do find the stomach to rewatch it again, um, I think we're going to laugh at our, our anxiety because they were literally taking shots for under 10s, you know, and um, their decision making. We were probably thinking, why was we so worried? Why were we slagging off half the players? <laughs> they, they, were, hmm. they were running around in second gear, you know. Um, I, I do feel on a more of a game side of things, game plan side of things, and we were debated on the IR, didn't we? Did we? Did we play like this on purpose or did we scoreboard watch? I I think there's probably a little bit of both in there. Um, we wanted to take the chaos out of their game, but we, were, we weren't aligned. We weren't in our normal units. We weren't connected like we normally are. So our passing game disappeared. And so I'm sure we'll get onto it later. But when you were doing your ebullient preview we did on our pod last week and you were so excited and giving us a five minute in your mind, I was I was a bit more cautious naturally, but I will say, you know, I will say that basically for me, we didn't play as we well, I expected us to play. So we, I didn't expect a performance like that. I didn't expect mm. us to not play like Arsenal you know, even for five or 10 minutes or so. And that surprised me. And that maybe told me that the tension was was there. It was real. It was real with the players. It was real in the club. They really wanted this. And then maybe that's what outlined the performance we actually got. Yeah. I mean, Tim, I want some honesty from you. Okay. We, we're all in WhatsApp groups with each other, with other friends, with friends we overlap with. But let's just say it. The WhatsApp is is the safe space to say your fan stuff that, you know, you wouldn't necessarily say in, in a measured analytical way, but you're willing to just let it out. I saw the lineup. I looked at the bench. There were a lot of WhatsApps sent congratulating us on a heavy victory before a ball was kicked <laughs> in anger. I mean, let's make no mistake about it. This is a United team that has averaged 17 and a half shots allowed per 90. That just got beat 4-0 at Palace and put out arguably a worse team on paper against us and had a bench. I mean, I'll just read it. Alte Bayendir, Christian Eriksen and Anthony, Willie Kambwala, Omari Forson, Toby Collier, Harry Amass, Habib Ogunier, Ethan Wheatley. That was the bench, okay? The lineup had players who have been dropping zero out of tens all season. I mean, Diallo comes in because they don't even have another wide player. Sophie and Amrabat, one of the worst players I've seen in the league this season, starts. Casemiro at center back. Just saying it now, forgetting the game that was played, I want to play him again today and see what happens. And I think that's the thing, right? The expectation was so big for a heavy victory that when the biggest thing that impacts your emotion is how reality measures against expectation, right? So if we thought we were going to get beat 5-0, we would be the happiest fan base in the world right now, right? I think it's the expectation that there was a hammering there. So we're, it is a wonderful historic result that pushes it right to the final day. And I'll read some comments from Mikel, but 
it's the lineup, right? You see that lineup. Because in my mind, I was like, well, if Bruno comes back and if Rashford comes back, you know, they, mm. they might have something for us. And if, if Lissandro Martinez comes back, suddenly you start reading these names and you say they can do something. When I saw it, I felt a wave of relief. And it just, you know, it, it, you got to be honest. You saw that lineup and you thought there could be something really on for us here, you know? I yeah, think, by the way, the old Trafford crowd, I thought so too, because there was a nervous hush that was flowing through them, especially after we took the lead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I definitely think so. And I and I really think that performance, like it it could have been a different result if um if they'd had some some of the names that I thought might be in the squad mm. at least um back. And it 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 reminded me a little bit of uh like I said, I was there when we lost eight two. And I remember seeing our team line up that day, and I, I got this really vivid memory of being in the concourse and the our team lineup flashing up. And uh, one of my mates was like, I'd take a 5 0 now. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like mm-hmm. a 5 0 defeat. And uh, that. Did that, Ignacy that... McKell start in central defense that day? No, or it was um, Co- Coquelin started. In... That was his yeah. first uh, start. And it was uh, Traore. Traore. Left back? Yes, yes. Yeah, tra- and, and he left like the next day. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah. And, we, and like our bench had like Gilles Sunu on it. And yeah, it was. Mm-hmm. It was Mm. <laughs> kind of like this for you know <laughs> yeah yeah exactly exactly and and you know i also like there were so many other pressures as well like uh, our record at old trafford i listened to the instant reaction on my way home and um you know initially i think my reaction was kind of the same as paul's like paul was talking about how we played the badge and we played the stadium and we played our record there i did feel that at the time having had time to reflect i do think it was less that more the situation in the table that played into yeah the way that we um the way that we played um on the day so yeah it's it's and also like with Ten Hag just going on and on and on about this bloody disallowed goal from September. And I was just like, I, I really, really want to shut him up as well because he keeps doing that. Oh, we deserve to win that game. It's like, no, you didn't. <laughs> you mm. didn't deserve to win that at all. And like, you know, if I was a United fan, which, you know, thankfully I'm not, I'd, I'd just be looking at that and I'd just be going, mate, like, you know, Ten Hag is really in this cycle of pissing on people's backs and telling them it's raining, and he's like whinging about the injury record as well in the in the aftermath of this game. And it's like, do, do you not think that maybe you might be responsible for that? Have you reflected on that at any point? Have you reflected on the Manchester United don't play friendlies um, <laughs> except when we play fifteen of them in about three weeks and knacker all our players? Like he just doesn't at least publicly just doesn't seem to be capable of any kind of self-reflection. And and I think he's just circling the drain there. He knows what's going to happen. He knows he can't turn it around, which is why he's making all these excuses. And I really, really just wanted to put that whole, Oh, go naturally scored a goal in September Mm. uh, and and all that rubbish. And yeah, it, 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 in the end as well, what was quite funny in the stadium was in the last kind of, 10 minutes where United are really going for it. You know, I think it's a mixture of them just knowing they're a bit crap at the moment. But like from their point of view, they didn't really want to win this game because they do, every United fan I talk to does not want Manchester City winning the league. So mm. they were in that peculiar situation that Spurs are going to be in on Tuesday night um, where like they kind of didn't want to win. And it was very, very, it, it felt quite obvious in that last 10 minutes. Maybe I've misread it and it was just hopelessness because it's like, who have we got trying to get this game back for us? Like Ethan Wheatley might be a good young player. Don't know, but he's about 12. And Anthony, like, it's probably not going to happen, is it? Um, no. But I, I definitely detected a bit of, I don't really want us to equalize here either. Like that that's the quietest I've ever heard Old Trafford. That's the yeah. the quietest I've ever heard it. And I think that's a mixture of resignation where they are, but also the peculiar situation they found themselves in as fans. Yeah, and and I look, some of that might be an eye toward the, the cup final because they don't have anything on the line in the league. Spurs might have something very much on the line in the league and they don't have a cup final to play. So sort of reverse situations. I think Mikel really summed it up well. And you have to parse his language because when you like 
When you hear a Mikel press conference, it's quite easy to understand what he's saying. When you read it, sometimes the words read out a little funny, but I, I think this makes a lot of sense. Whether he was nervous to see the result out, he said yes, because at the end, you know that a draw, what the consequences are after that. And when you are there and you really want it, and I felt the team was in a really good space before the game. We started the game well, we scored the goal, but that goal, I think, touched something, especially with the duties and the things that we have to do in both possessions. And we started to play too safe, not respecting any structure and knowing our purpose, and I didn't like it. I would have to change that. And when we wanted to change it, we struggled to do so. But if you don't have that element of the game to be more dominant and be more present in the game, you have to be extraordinary at competing and doing the defensive things right. And after all that, we were excellent. Look, Clive, that for me is is the whole explanation. You could really put the whole pod down to that, I think, which is we got a goal. The space was there for us to play progressively. We were hesitant. We knew what was at stake, and we chose to be safe, and everyone chose to be safe, and we protected what we had, and we defended well, and we got over the line. And in the cold light of day, on the second to last day of the season, that's fine. That gets it done. I'm curious if you could observe for me what you think was missing from our play on this day. Was it as simple as the tempo was too slow and the intention to play was not there and we were conservative? Was there something United did that blunted us? I mean, what I will say is I've watched United all season because they've been blockbuster entertainment. They don't run. They don't care. They don't hustle. They don't fight. They fought in this game. They hustled in this game. They they at least, I mean, except for Casemiro on the goal, which is comical, but like they put a lot of bodies in midfield and those bodies ran around. And that's more than you could say for what they've been doing most of the season. What what did you see either from them or from us? That's the reason why we struggled to, you know, create the volume of chances that traditionally Manchester United just gift you over ninety minutes. Yeah, they had a, a structure, United. Let's talk about them first. They had a they had a structure and they had a bit of balance as well. Uh, Ahmed on the right, you know, lefty coming in. Garnacho on the left, his preferred side. So he's coming in and he had a few excursions down our right hand side. But Tom Lee as a, a pressing ten, you know, with Cubby Mind you and um who else and Amrabat in there. So you had three sort of worker day midfielders. I thought before game they're gonna come and kick us. You know, that's what I thought. So I thought they so were, too. I thought Amrabat and McTominay would just run around kicking people, basically. Yeah, yeah I thought it would be quite physical. We know they got you know, Dallow's a, I think Dallow's a good player actually. I think he's he can hold his head up this season. And um uh, Wamba Saka's just uh, he can he can do one thing on his right foot. If you go on his outside, he can tackle you, but on crosses, he can't do anything. He's, he's he might as well be flying kites like the Spurs players are right now. He might as well be flying <laughs> kites. And so, um, I believe those were the Fulham players. Let's be fair. <laughs> no, the Spurs have just released a TikTok, mate. I sent it to your DM. Check it out just now. No, and uh, God, and they're flying kites no, in don't, training. Well, not like this, please. <laughs> <laughs> and. Um, and obviously, the centre backs. I mean, you know, we know about them. So, but they had balance. So they, but they also had a, a period in a game where they had distances, you know. And I, and I think it it, it spooked us a little bit. It spooked us, and I, I didn't feel a level of confidence. So we've Arsenal now. We we didn't play our game, and I, you know what? We are one game away from ending the season where we should be talking about joy. I have such a disappointment by the way we played. I really, I didn't expect a big win, but I wanted us to have a desire to have a statement win, and, and we didn't. Mm. The desire to manage risk seemed to be the the priority here, which is a little bit of a shame. Uh, but I can't critique too much. Do you see what I mean? I feel it feels churlish. It feels churlish when can, we can, just can I stop you for won. a second? Yeah, because you just touched you touched something inside me. Yuck. Uh, that, that I think connects to very much what you said, which is we all know we might not win the title this season, right? We know that despite mm. doing so much, having one of the great seasons in club history. And I think for me, there was this little voice in the back of my head that's like, but a 5 nil at Old Trafford, even if we don't win the title to send us into the side. You know what I mean? I almost wanted one last big j- historic joy. If I can't have the title, right? That I could take, we beat Chelsea five nil, right? I will take that for years. I think it's, I don't want to, it's not fair to ask the team to do that, but I think because we know the title might not be ours, despite all the great work we've done, I think I wanted one more big gift to go off into the summer with, to take, to sort of paper over the wounds of doing so much and not getting a title, if that makes sense. 
you know? Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. I, I wanted a statement win, is what I called it pre, yeah. pre-game. And and when you saw that team sheet come out, you thought, this is it. This is it. And we started so good. We In the first two minutes, Gabriel's literally three yards outside of their penalty box peeing them in. Mm-hmm. I'm thinking, lads, be careful. Do you know what I mean? There's suffocation. It's just like <laughs> real suffocation. And we create chances, and then and then we score. And it's like, well, here we go. But it, it didn't happen, and and so it, when you when you support this team like we, like we do, and they have the most wins in their one hundred and thirty year history, it feels a little bit wrong for us to be killing them when they haven't got their midfield right or they didn't play the ball forward enough, and and Ben White got run past the cut. It feels it, it doesn't feel right, Elliot, to me. Do you know what I mean? Although we all saw mm-hmm. it, and, we, and and that's what we'll talk about. But yeah, I was, I was just disappointed that we didn't we didn't show ourselves to the to the country. But maybe in adversity, what you do, you you refer back to who you are, and who we are is a very strong, well structured team that can low block, that can mid block, that can really win their one on ones when they need to. But they've really learned this season to defend their box, and for all the discomfort we felt around a lack of midfield flow and and connection. And Tim was there. When the ball went into the box, it actually, I actually got I felt better. Go on, stick it in the box because you're going to get nothing, you know. And that's that's an attribute that we've really learned this year, this calendar year, you know, the way our back line handles itself and the way our goalkeeper controls the space beyond the back line. So they've got to be perfect in our box to get our chances, and and we can lean on that now. And um, so yeah, if I focus on that side of things, we were great. But on the flow side of things, which we've been so good, particularly on our right-hand side build-up, I'm disappointed we didn't show our best face in that regard. Yeah, yeah. It's it's interesting to see how the game started to play out. I mean, Kai Havertz got in. I wonder if the game would have been different if this happened. Because sometimes you, you get a really early goal and the, the opposition gets real scared of what's coming. Um, Kai Havertz got in on goal and opted to kind of cross it instead of just taking the shot low and hard across the keeper. He's been so decisive in his actions recently. I thought that was wrong, but to be fair to Kai, I mean, he and Leo do brilliantly on the goal. Tim, we don't usually do moments analysis, but I just think since it is the moment, um, we'll cover it. It's it's almost too easy because Casemiro is having a nice lie down and just you know enjoying the day. Enjoying the day before the storms broke out. And by the way, we could do a whole section if you want on A River Runs Through It, which is the new title of Old Trafford. I mean, it was it was crazy if you saw the videos. I don't know if you saw it after the skies opened up uh, at the end of the game, late in the game. Old Trafford was literally leaking, not just leaking into the, the stands, but leaking into the away dressing room. Um, so I, I saw someone call it, and uh, apologies for stealing it, the Theater of Wet Dreams, which... It's kind of gross, but also quite I funny. Was, I was absolutely soaked to the bone <laughs> coming mm. out of the stadium. Like it was biblical. It's one. It's some of the worst rain I've I've ever. Been. It was like at ten seconds, and it's like taking a shower in your clothes. Is what it was like. It was disgusting. Yeah, yeah, totally disgusting. Um, but but for the goal, you know, I don't know what to say about Trissard. Like it is. It is so interesting to have this player right now. He has just come through with an unbelievable run of important goals against Porto, against Bayern, against Brighton, against, you know, United, against just on and on and on. I mean, he scored in almost every one of our games in the run-in. But you know what's interesting? Credit to Phil Costa when we did our our Schadenfreude pod. If you didn't hear it, by the way, on Friday, we did a pod on Patreon, which is the best non-Arsenal moments of the season. I think it's my favorite pod we've done this season. But we did a little United preview, mini one at the beginning. And he said, they just concede the same goal every game all season. Get to the byline, cut it back, they can't stop it. And he said, Mikel will certainly have told him that, and he seemed to have. But I love the intelligence of the way Trissard makes the run. He he lets the defenders collapse first so they can't see him, and then runs into the space they vacated so they can't track him. And it's it's really well executed. And on a day where we didn't have much about us, I mean, Casemiro gifts us the space to get into, but I still think Kai and Trissard do brilliantly there. Yeah, absolutely. And and we've kind of seen, it's, it's been really interesting, some of the evolutions this year, because at first we kind of saw this Havertz-Trossard partnership where we were kind of playing Trossard in the, the left date with Havertz up front. 
but like they were almost like a like a strike partnership and then that's kind of evolved because Trossard's gone back out wide and then you've got Havertz and Odegaard have been doing this dual tens thing but I think you can see there's a good understanding between these players because I think one of the ways in which Trossard has really started to fit into this team I wrote about this last week tap the mug first of all I think having a more orthodox left back um, is part of it so he's not being asked to do what Martinelli was asked to do which is basically be a bit of an island out on the left wing like having a more orthodox left back in Tomiyasu and Kivior before him I think just gives him that license to go inside and go wandering and you look at all his goals recently that they're all very similar first time late arriving uh, you know, arriving onto the ball. He's really, really good at that. He's really, really good at kind of, because he's that off-ball player and he has like, you look at the, the number of touches, our forwards average this season, he's only just above Nketiah um, in terms of touches per 90, which I think tells you he's almost like the striker in the team at the moment. He's he's like the the centre forward, but most of his goals have been coming from that half space. That's that's where Trot, like wherever you play him, if you play him as a false nine, he drifts out to the half space. You play him wide, he drifts into the half space. That's that's where he wants to be. But this was a, a striker's goal, and this was like you say, he lets the he has the intelligence to let the United players kind of go first and then makes his run. And you know he does that kind of one movement for the defender, one movement for me um, type thing as well, and. Yeah, it, I, I guess there's a tinge of sadness in this goal because it's exactly like the chance he has against Villa, which I, Martinez... I, I tweeted that. People didn't like it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Martinez throws out a leg and saves it. And it's it's exactly the same finish. It's just this one went in. And yeah, and Trossard's just been such an important player for us. But all of his goals, if you go back and look at them, all the same. Someone else like does... You know, think back to Bayern and Wolves. Jesus like breaks himself in two, trying to keep the ball alive, and Trossard arrives onto it. You know, he's he's very very good at he's he's become like the finisher in the team, and I don't just mean the finisher in terms of sticking the ball in the net. I mean someone who comes arrives onto the ball, comes onto it late, and I think a lot of people have been saying uh, the name Freddie Jungberg over the last week or two. I think I think that's a very very apt comparison and. Hopefully, his goals will have the same impact as Freddie Jungberg's did in the spring of 2002. Yeah, I mean, we we don't necessarily control that, but I will take it, yes. Um, Clive, I want to do the, the really good, because there is really good, and it is our defense, and I want to spend a lot of time talking about it. But before we do, I just want to talk midfield a little, because if you ask me where we kind of short-circuited, I think that's that's the zone of the pitch where we short-circuited. A couple of things to note here I think that are interesting. Martin Odegaard averages close to nine progressive passes a game. He had six. Thomas Party also close to nine a game. He had four. Declan Rice usually about seven and a half a game. He had four. Um, Declan Rice averages almost you know four passes into the final third. He had one. Thomas Party, uh, pardon me, Rice is almost six and a half, seven. Party is usually almost eight. He had three. And the press it, with the midfield too, Rice was... I think playing too deep, he didn't get up into the areas where he can usually kill people off the ball. Uh, so, well, it's funny off the ball. I thought we dropped away on the ball. I thought rice ran away and wasn't able to get it and had almost no touches in the first half. I think he had what 13 or 14 touches in the first half. Um, but there was just something about the dynamic in midfield that didn't feel right to me. Our press felt much less intense. Maybe that was the intention that we were ready to drop into a mid block early but I thought that let them progress it right to the edge of our final third. So we were in a low block more than you, you see us. And I just think our intention to progress the ball was not there. I don't know if it was distances or, or if it was just a mindset like Mikel talked about. So for me, the midfield was where we didn't look like Arsenal. Paul always has a way with words. He said it on the instant reaction. He says, we forgot how to Arsenal for a por portion of that game. And, and it kind of felt that way. What did you see in midfield in particular that, that didn't look sort of familiar with how we've been playing, especially the last five months. So, yeah, the, the context of this game, so we were all racked with nerves, right? So so we, we're immediately looking at things that are not quite right. So I didn't like some of the early sloppy touches, right? So I think there was a couple of slips there. Uh, Thomas Party got robbed. 
And when he gets robbed early, I always wonder if he's quite at the races, you know, so um, which I didn't think he was. I didn't like the light. I didn't like the height of Declan Rice. I, I felt he was too low on some occasions and too high on other occasions. So totally he wasn't agree. he wasn't connected, right? Odegaard got. I think he found himself receiving the ball facing our own goal, and I think that's his biggest weakness. I think he doesn't protect it, almost posting up. But when he receives it on the half turn, he starts to manipulate and move it across the line. Well, he has no peer, right? So. When we go into Saka on the right, we have two connections on the right-hand side. It's normally Party or and Odegaard. I didn't see them connecting with him, so their line height wasn't wasn't right. So we lost it, and in in the end, we ended up playing a game which didn't suit that midfield. It suited Jorginho, if I'm honest with you, particularly once we scored, because what Jorginho does that Thomas Party doesn't do is I feel he coaches the others, you know, and I mm. think he makes other people better. And because he has limitations, people get around him better. So he drags out a more connected game, right? So, so you know, I do remember the Bayern games where his physical limits were exposed and we didn't dominate in semi midfield. But in this game, there was nothing to worry about. We needed to be coached through a traumatic moment that we we're all feeling and get some connections going and some direction going. So again, the Georgina to have that thing would have been a bit better, you know? So we just missed somebody to say, relax, lads. It's all right. Do you know what I mean? And so we end up with Thomas Party playing a Jorginho game and Jorginho's better at playing as that than Thomas Party is. Mm. Going backwards, because we expect different things from him. We expect him to turn out and get us going forward. And we didn't have a lot of go forward. Now, if I talk about a bit on go forward, I thought Saka's positioning was quite narrow. So we didn't have our exit passes out to the right hand side. So I wasn't pleased with his positioning. Just as Tim's already touched on, he can go where he likes, mate. He's sticking the ball in there. So I'm not going to talk about him, right? Because our dreams are nowhere near it without him being the player he is. I thought Havertz had his worst game of the year so far. Didn't really hold the ball up. And so there were so many things that were not quite right. But from a, with, with particularly with Thomas Pye, what happens is because he is such a totem pole the way he receives it, I think he's the first one. He almost dictates where we are and the rhythm of our team. And when he's off, off his game, which he was in this game, I think we need to do something quicker around that. Do you know what I mean? A bit quicker. It, they didn't cause any problems, right? Look at the XG against. It didn't cause any problems. But I can't help. And I'm not an attack guy. I am I am not, you know, I prefer defensive football and structured football. And we attack from that base. So you could say, you know, I got the game I wanted. But no, I felt, I felt cheated by a lack of attack. You know, I felt cheated by a lack of forward passing. And Mikel maybe touched on why. Maybe it was, it was a prize. But I just felt a height connectivity wasn't there and I and because of that I just another thing I felt all three of them did you Tim did you did they look leggy to you did they look leggy in the ground I thought we looked leggy in that midfield we did we lacked Very much sharpness so. I haven't looked at us and thought because we're a fit side by the way we we smashed teams on fitness but for all of them to be so leggy at the same time I, I just found that I did did you know none of us were talking about that in the preview pods were we and um so maybe the tension nerves of the do moment, that to you, though, Clive. To that. There Can't, you go, mate. You just said it. Candidly, I think nerves can, you know, your muscles, we've all done, you ever, you ever done anything where you're nervous and everything yeah. just tightens up a little bit? You know, I mean, I can't say I know what it feels like to be in their shoes, but I, I think that could be part of it, you know? It, it, I they have think a team you're with right, very, then. very little to play for, except everyone's told them they're going to get humiliated and they all they have to try to do is stay in the game. And you have another team that's been told you're going to bottle it again at Old Trafford. You know, you you're supposed to win. Yeah, that that that's a hard dynamic. You know. So I found I found myself, and funny enough, it's only it's only for a brief period. When Georgina came on, he just sort of um did a couple of things that reminded me that he's actually quite fresh now. You know, we have played the same team for four games or so. He looked quite sharp. He's gone in, and I I just mm, could we have made that change a little bit sooner and, and nicked the second goal, which I think we deserved? You know, I think we left a goal out there. That's a, that was a two nil mm. game. But hey, look, we are we are we are skirting at the edges of this, aren't we? Really, on our twenty seventh win of the season. However, 
that's the first time I've looked at that midfield and thought, okay, this isn't right. And, you know, projecting forward, we've got we've got a decision to make in midfield, haven't we, about that player that comes in, that we know we need, mm. what that player is, how they're gonna how they're gonna work. I, I I generally haven't got the answer yet. I change every week because in this game I wanted Declan Rice back in the six for a bit. You know what I mean? Or or just double pivot it. But it's one game. But I didn't I didn't like what I saw if I'm honest, you know, yet. Yeah, it, there was just something not quite right about the midfield. And look, Jorginho's 32. We've just re-signed him. He'll play some next season, but he'll mm. be a leader in the in the dressing room, so to speak, and he'll play some minutes here and there. Thomas Party's turning 31 in June. What I think is interesting about Party and Jorginho, everybody manages their their shortcomings in different ways. Um, and like, I think Thomas Party, his instinct, because he doesn't want to be in a running race, is to drop a little bit and give room. And Jorginho's instinct is to be to do what Shaka did, right? Like the early engagement. He'll try to jump a pass or intercept a pass or engage with you early because he, he trusts his reading of the game, but he doesn't trust his running because he can't, can't run. So those are two different dynamics. And maybe that impacts how you press. Because like Sophie and Amrabat, other than Casemiro, had the most touches in the United team, okay? He had 81 touches. And he played 13 passes into the final third more than double what any player on Arsenal did, more than triple, I think. Uh, ben White had five, okay? That paced us. He had 13, Casemiro had 10, and those were their players with the most touches. And I thought they were very able to drop in, receive the ball off Johnny Evans, right, or Juan Bissaka, and turn. And that's just not normally the case with, I think you play this game in three months ago when there's not as much on the line or when we're really up for it, and I think Sophie and Amrabat getting 81 touches dropping in would be our dream because he'd be getting absolutely shut down immediately there, the ball taken off, and we'd be scoring goal after goal after goal. Didn't happen. Totally okay. Clive, uh, final thought on that? Yeah, we, we just let them play too much, didn't we? We yeah, let them that, play. Yeah, exactly. We let them have mm-hmm. the ball. It wasn't threatening. But, mate, footballers are footballers, right? If you let them have the ball, mm-hmm. they start to feel themselves. They start to grow in confidence. And the crowd started to sing. I mean, they they come to they come for a funeral, and they started to mm-hmm. they, they come they started to sing. And you're thinking, hold on, lads, lads, these lot of rubbish. Don't let them grow, you know. And and so everything we did thereafter was under the microscope, you know. And um, hey, look, they've obviously got a conf- sometimes the best judge of a football match is other players, and they're looking around thinking, don't worry, lads, we got this. They can do what they like. They're not going to score. But we're thinking, hold on a minute, <laughs> they might score and my life will be ruined if they do score sort of thing. I think the, the contrast between how you feel on the pitch versus how you watch a game came across in the, in this moment. But I'm disappointed around um, certain aspects of the midfield. And you know I'm a Thomas Party fan, but I, mm. I've got eyes, Elliot. I've got eyes. And this wasn't a good day for him. There are others didn't have a good day, but... This guy's got one year to go on his contract. And so when he has a bad day, you start to think forward about the next future of uh, our centre midfield. Yeah, yeah. I think um, we should shift gears, though, to to the thing that made this a win and the positives. And the clear positive is when you go away, you have to be able to defend. You have to. Um, Whatever you wanted, this is where you have to stop being petulant for a minute. I wanted lots of goals. I wanted us to batter them. But you're you're still playing against, to your point, Clive, professional footballers who sh- decided to show some pride for the first time in the season. And there was a lot on the line, and we got a goal. And from there, once you have a 1-0 lead, I'm going to tell you something pretty insightful about football that maybe you haven't heard before. So, you know, this is my chance to show my knowledge. At 1-0, if you don't concede, you will win the game. That's how that works. And honestly, however stressful we felt, they barely had a sniff. They barely had a sniff. 0.6 XG. They just barely, barely had a sniff. And I mean, if you look at the last half hour or so, it's all speculative shots from 30 yards, from 26 yards, really speculative shots that just had nothing about it. And there was one moment, Tim, that sort of sums up to me our our recovery running and our organization. We did get cut open once a bit in a way that's uncharacteristic. They just found a way too easy pass right into the penalty area to Hoyland with his back to goal. 
right? He was pinning, was it Saliba he's pinning, I think? And or maybe it was Gabriel. 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 Yeah, it was yeah. Gabriel. Re- it was really too easy, very uncharacteristic. I blinked and we had five defenders back in the box closing down the space. There's just a tremendous commitment to defending, tremendous quality. You know, Raya gets in and cleans up all the crosses. The defenders are, are so organized. And you know what I'm going to praise here, Tim? The thing that really stood out to me about our defending is the number of challenges we made in the box that were clean, that weren't diving in, that were composed, not panicked, blocking when we had to block, positioning our body properly. There is a skill to challenging in the box where you don't give the ref a decision to make. The only decision he had to make was when Thomas Party was on the ground and challenged. It's not a foul. He gets the ball, but you don't obviously want to be on the ground because then someone can go over your leg. But other than that, Tim... I thought the commitment to, to defending was excellent. And the guy who summed it up today, yesterday, on the day, was William Saliba, who was back to his imperious best after a few games where I think Gabriel had sort of carried the load. We're now seeing the best Saliba. So is that what stands out to you, the, the professionalism, organization, and talent of our defense that has been the bedrock of our away form this season? Yeah, absolutely. Like, you know, different games call for different things. I think... Uh, I'm not sure they were encouraged to do this, but I think there was a, a subconscious, at least, decision from this team very early. We're sitting on this pretty much very soon after the first goal. Is we're sitting, and uh, that infuriated me at the mm. time. I think the words "Why the fuck are we sitting off?" Uh, emanated from my mouth at great volumes on several occasions during the game. Um, but that that was clearly the the decision. Um, you know, just a one-liner on the, the midfield. The distances were horrendous because Partey was... There were times where I thought he was in goal. Um, there were times where Saliba and Gabriel were looking to push up and they had to, like, take him with them. I, I don't really know what he was doing, but he was playing basically as a so third centre-back and didn't. I, I didn't see him in the centre circle at any point. I was a horrendous performance from him and rice was way off to the left mm-hmm. um as well and it just there was no mid and, and united don't play with the midfield so i kept looking at the center circle and just being like how am i watching a football game and nobody's ever in the center circle mm. um, but the the defense like with saliba and gabriel i've been thinking about this with the kind of you know player of the year award nominations and all of that i i just they they come as a pair to me and i think that's that's why it's difficult for one or other of them to get nominated for these things because they just come as such a pair and I think we're seeing all of the things we missed when William Saliba came out of the team last year. And by the well, by the way, if Gabriel's back had gone last March and we played without him for two months of the run in, I think we'd have seen pretty much exactly the same thing. They're they're both so good, they're so complementary. And there are some games, to your point, there are some that are Gabriel games, there are some like body on the line blocks, you know. Uh, playing against Harry Kane or someone like that, where you want like a real one-on-one, you know, Gabriel's your guy for those. And then there are the defending space games, defending the penalty area. And they're both good at both things, don't get me wrong, but this was a defending space game. This was a, okay, we're, we're sitting off, we're sitting off in our shape and Saliba just owns that space. He completely owns it. And, you know, I I saw this pointed out on Twitter more than once, like he's walked away from the Etihad, Anfield and Old Trafford with the man of of the match tucked under his arm. And he's 22. Like centre-backs don't do this at 22. Like you think about the very best in the game. Like when Tony Adams was 22, people people were making donkey noises at him. Um, When Sol Campbell was 22, I think he was still playing at right back for Spurs. Mm. Like... Some of the best centre halves, you know, that have played for our club and played in the Premier League have not been doing this at the age of twenty two. And I think also he just he brings such a calm. He just really he's really got that aura where he's so calm and so unflustered, but he doesn't ever, to me, and, and I this is the only criticism in the world I would ever have about Ben White, where sometimes very occasionally he can drift into that Ainsley Maitland Niles zone where it's like there's there's being calm and there's being a bit a bit 
Casual. Too laid back. Casual. Yeah, I never see that from Saliba. Like he's always just like right on it. He's right on that line. And and I thought he was absolutely superb. And this was this was this was a shape game because we we encouraged a lot of pressure. They did nothing with it. They had very, very few chances. Raya as well. Uh, when they were throwing crosses in, he was there. And it reminded me of when we played the Europa League semi-final away at Atleti in 2018 and we needed a goal. And I was behind the goal we were attacking and high up. And I was looking at it. And this was peak Atleti Simeone. And I, I, I felt hopeless. I was just like, there's no gap. There's no... there's. Like I, I don't even have the someone's going to have to wallop one in from 30 yards because I don't even see how we do it. That was kind of how I felt about us defending. I did feel like obviously anything can happen, but I did feel quite safe. And it's it's amazing that Arsenal can do this, that we are good enough now off the ball to be able to do this because sometimes you have to. Sometimes you have to do you know, the the dirty side of the game and, you know, to the point I made a few weeks ago, it's the great thing about this manager. He respects every side of the game. And, you know, we've be- we've been an elite team on the ball, I think, for a little while. The transformation off the ball from last season to this season is unreal, absolutely unreal. And all of those players, Saliba, Gabriel, Rice, Raya, White, Tommy Asset, they all deserve all of the credit in the world for that. We'll finish the season with 13 wins away, three draws, three losses. In 19 matches played, we've conceded 13 goals on our travels. That's outrageous. Five fewer than City, who still have to go to Spurs where they'll concede, you know, let's just say three, for example. Um, So they'll finish on 21 conceded away, 13 for us. And that would make them second best. It's an astonishing record. By the way, we've scored plenty on our travels. It's not like we have, we have, we have, uh, 43 goals scored on our travels, which also joint most with City, who won't be scoring at Spurs, so they'll stay on 43. So, yeah, I mean, just incredible record. Obviously, the moment that summed up Saliba, the clean challenge on Garnacho in the box where he just takes it off him, he slips over and then just makes a comfortable pass from his bottom uh, to, to get us going forward. Clive, to sort of wrap up on the game, I think we should talk subs for a minute, and we can go big picture. The only sub that I really think is worth talking about, particularly, is Martinelli. And it's funny because there's a part of me that's like, I'd love to see the world where Martinelli played this whole game. But by the same token, the guy he came on for scored the goal that won us the game. But, you know, Martinelli has almost been our Nunez recently. Every time he comes on, immediately there are chances. Immediately he's in, immediately there are chances. What he's not doing, which is so uncharacteristic for him, is he's not showing the composure and the technique and the final action, which I think will come back. And I know we we know he can do. He was our leading goal scorer last season. But it's so interesting to see how he comes on and immediately that verticality in our game, because we played, let's be honest, we played too many long balls and a lot of them more hopeful than expectant. He's immediately in. He had one where he probably could have slid it out wide, but he just didn't, I think to Jesus, after Jesus come on for Saka, just didn't get it out of his feet. He had the one where he's in. I think he could have played in three or four teammates, decides to go it alone. and, And to be fair, it's an excellent, excellent save from Onana from a great shot from Martinelli. I don't know how he finds the space to get that shot off. Thoughts on that little cameo there and just that a player who we kind of have had kept in the garage this this run in a bit. But I, I think there are still big things to come from him at Arsenal. And he he creates an electricity when he's on the pitch that we don't have otherwise, really. Yeah, so you, you sort of covered the cameo earlier. But what I will say is... Um, the... Fair enough. <laughs> I will say the it's been quite instructive to see where he has to improve isn't it? In this team, what we're doing right now. And he he has to improve his movement before the ball arrives. And Mm. for me, that's more important than the last action because the last action will come. Right? So, you know, he can kick it both feet. Inside of foot, laces, it's no problem. I've seen it with my own eyes. For example, Palace last season, left foot shot, bang. You know, he's got all the banging shots. He's got the curlers. He's got all the reverse shots. He's got them all. But what he's not doing is getting himself into the right position. And a, a 29, 30-year-old Trossard is showing him how to travel across the line. You know, mm-hmm. If he learns that ability with his athleticism and ability to repeat sprint, then the world is going to have a problem. But he has to make himself more threatening. You know, Not focus, maybe at the start of the season, he was focused on being an enabler, an assist maker, a, a carrying winger. You need to carry smart. You know. Um, 
Arsene Wenger used to have this thing where he'd, he'd do training drills with, with wingers and he'd, he would say, don't dribble yourself into the dark. Stay in the light. Mm. If you dribble yourself to the byline on your weak foot, that's where a defender wants you to be under pressure. Trust me, that's where they want you to go. If you can travel on the inside, use your strong foot on the inside, you're now coming into the lights where a pass or a shot becomes available. And I felt it's been too easy to go into the dark and and be ineffective, not be threatening, and be shepherded away from the danger areas. And in football, it's a common thing. The first person that gets substituted is a wide man to make a difference. Always happens. Uh, centre mids and centre half, they don't really get changed too often. Um, but wide players are the first ones to go, right? And um, and so if you're not being threatening, you're going to come off, right? And so how we've used it with Trossard has been really good. He got a good chunk of minutes in this game. And Elliot, I'm with you. I thought he did quite well. And I was calling for him after 15 minutes, which is unlike me, but I just felt we had them if we, he, he was on the pitch. But he's having a dip. He's 22, 23. He's having a dip. And we are just bringing him back. You know, I think he got picked for the Copa America in the summer, I think. I believe he's in the squad. So he goes away. He he did. And interestingly, Gabriel Magalhaes, the mm-hmm. last choice defender for Brazil, got picked. And Richarlison, the first choice striker for Brazil, did not get picked. <laughs> so just a reminder to be careful what you say sometimes, Richarlison, because uh, that is hilarious. Anyway, go ahead. Yeah, so uh, he got picked. A so different environment, and uh, maybe different expectations on him could be could be good. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm hopefully he comes back because I find myself when I'm looking going through my transfer window machinations as well, as I'm doing already. I'm looking at that position if I'm honest with you, and I and I wouldn't have said that a year ago. I'm looking at that position and maybe centre forward, and maybe maybe that's what's required a real real offensive threat but we have him mm. so why am i saying that you know we have him you know and but i think we lack threat during this game we what we're talking about now if you if i said to you defensive stability tick offensive threat where are we going? it's not there is it at the moment not where what not where it could be you know and um we scored our most goals in our history and we're complaining <laughs> About, it, mm. about goals but if we want to go to the top of the house we need more offensive threats and maybe more offensive aura the same way we talk about our defensive side of the game right now yeah and, and look i think everybody who listens to this pod is pretty smart understands football you could say oh we scored you know our most goals it's two consecutive seasons now we've had historic xg over performance now That could mean something. Maybe there's something about our game that creates chances where we're able to finish above XG. Maybe we just have supremely talented players. But on XG, we have roughly the same chance creation that Chelsea had, right? I mean, that's roughly where we are. I don't think anybody has any illusions about it. Defensively, we're as good as they come. We can power up our attack a little more. And I think that's the next thing we should try to do to chase Manchester City while remembering we're about to have potentially the second best season in the history of the club in terms of points and goals and goal difference and all that, there's no guarantee you get any better. (laughs) Sometimes you're chasing perfection. There's no perfection in football. This is what Manchester City do to you. You try to get a little better and you try to get a little better. And sometimes you find out there's no, there's no better to get. Um, Another quick thing here, Tim Jesus came on for Saka, a weird game for Saka, just a bit muted. The whole right-hand side didn't look right. You know, we just didn't look like ourselves. Saka Hmm. though, the body language wasn't great. He seemed frustrated most of the game. And when he came off, you know, I was a little worried about the injury. Mikel said, it's nothing. He's fine. Um, it just didn't you come off for have him. Seen, sorry, you should have seen Arteta when like, because as soon as he, he kind of went down off the pitch mm-hmm. yep. and Arteta immediately called for, for Jesus. Jesus and then Saka came back on. And like Arteta, I was I, I could see him mm-hmm. for like the whole game. So he was actually like very measured, very calm in the technical area. The one time, he did get very demonstrative, was telling Saka to sit down. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, d- I don't yeah. quite know how Saka didn't get the message straight away because it was like, sit down, sit down, sit down, sit down! And it was it was very, very <laughs> funny to see him increasingly <laughs> lose his shit where he was obviously trying to do it subtly and Saka didn't register. So he had to really wave his arms. And, and I think, um, yeah, I think the word fog in uh, came out a few times. <laughs> 
Yeah, it, it, no, it, it's it's funny because like uh, I also it looked like you know I can only see so much on TV. It's whatever they show you. It looked like Zach was almost saying, "Hang on, give me a minute. I think I can stay on." And I think Mikel was like, "No, no I can't see the rest of you at the end of you today." Um, I don't know. Like I don't obviously. Sack is our player of the season. He's our best player and he's had a brilliant season. It, it, I, this is a day where things didn't come off for a number of our players. I think Mikel should be and can be even more trusting in the phenomenal options he has, even when your best player. I mean, we saw Mohamed Salah get taken off in a game and then say, if I talk, it'll be fire or I'll start a fire or something like that, right in the mix zone. Um, you have to be careful with your star players. They they want to stay on the pitch. But when you've got guys like Gabriel Jesus and Gabriel Martinelli on the bench, right, and Jorginho midfield, you don't have to necessarily be as un- unwilling to take off the guys who you regard as your clear stars. So, you know, I'm, I think that was the right change to make. I don't think Gabriel Je- Gabriel Jesus had much of an opportunity to do anything. But any any concerns on the Saka part of it or just one of those days where for most of our team it was just not really coming off yeah it wasn't coming off and and again I talked about Gabriel and Saliba being a pairing I think that goes for Erdegaard and Saka as well and neither of them were on it were they really and I do think a lot of that was you know recently their supply line has been Thomas Partey and that's something that he's been able to bring them into games because of the way he shapes and passes and that wasn't happening because he was sat in the upper tier um somewhere <laughs> Um, and so, and so, yeah, it 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 just wasn't happening for him. And you know, he did get like essentially a laceration on his shin last week. So as much as I think Arteta was being a bit cute, saying there was a doubt for the game, when I don't think there was any doubt whatsoever. Like, you know, he he's he's got a knock there. We we all saw mm-hmm. the picture, I think, because I think I you know I think I. I, you know, feel a little bit of intimacy with Bukayo Saka, but I think I've seen his shin bones now um, after that tackle last Tim, week. Tim, if I had so, that injury, I'd be calling out sick for a week and yeah. telling people that I might need surgery like, and at, send flowers to the house, you know? Yeah, <laughs> like we, we think of things a lot, like in terms of muscle, muscles, ligaments, broken bones and stuff, but that hurts, man. <laughs> that really hurts. And mm. that's going to affect your mobility a little bit, I think. So, But don't get me wrong, I, I don't think that's the main reason, I think pretty much everyone was kind of off it. Havertz wasn't on it. Erdegaard wasn't on it. Rice had his fewest touches of the season, I think. Like, it it was just a game where very, it kind of reminded me of um, when we played Villarreal in the second leg of the Champions League semi-final in 2006 and we had a 1-0 lead and the team just decided we're going to try and draw this game 0-0 <laughs> because cause we're, we're terrified. And it did feel a little bit like that. So I, I don't have any like long-term concerns whatsoever. I, I do think it was a, an off day, uh, but for, for pretty much everyone, and, and I think Arteta's right, as soon as we went 1-0 up, we kind of stopped playing and lent on those guys at the back. And, I you know, I, yeah. I can live with it. I can live with it. I don't want to kill them about it. And mm. I'm just, I'm ecstatic that we've got the sort of, defense where we can do that when we need to yeah he's good look he's gonna play against Everton I have no doubt he just looks like a player to me understandably with the amount he gets kicked in the minutes he has who could desperately use the summer to get started (laughs) and he's gonna play 90 minutes of every single game for England and it is he's the player that I look at and I say what do we do about you it's one of the reasons I think we have to go wide forward in the summer maybe two wide forwards in the summer it's one of the reasons I'm glad Gabriel Jesus isn't going off with Brazil because frankly I'd start next season with Gabriel Jesus off the right or our new signing off the right and Kai through the middle and give Saka more time after the Euros because right now he's a player I look at and I say, you need to get your feet up and there's just no time for him to do that. I mean, to be fair, when you're the best players in the world, when you're Messi or Ronaldo or Salah or Holland or Mbappe, like this is the career until you hit 32 or 34, whenever it is, this is kind of what you've signed up for. Clive, final thought on that, and then we can go big picture. Yeah, well, none of those players do the defensive work that Saka does for us as well. And mm. I saw some radars going out earlier. About... saying Lionel Messi wasn't a, a stout defender in his prime, wasn't <laughs> running all over the pitch to defend? All right, fair enough. So we're a team, aren't we? And so we defend as 11 and we attack as 11. So when we have a clean sheet and t- away from home at Old Trafford and we defend it as a unit, I'm sort of like, don't want to kill him too much. But we know the defensive numbers on our right hand side weren't great in this game, and that has a that has a knock on effect. So Ben White gets run past four or five times, which never happens, never happens. And um, so what happens then? Sleeper's got to go out to the right. 
to go to get in behind him. He has a spectacular game mm. because he's the secondary guy in behind. All his tackles with big tackles on the right hand side, right? So he does his Bobby Moore tackle against Garnacho. We're all going to remember it, right? So, and but then what happens then? Thomas Party then has to drop into centre back, which he can do, right? Then he doesn't get out. He gets comfortable between the centre backs. So we don't. We stop engaging we start playing in areas if we stop engaging we can't win the transitions we don't create transitions what do we what does Sacco know the guard like little transition passes not getting them it's like it's it's frustrating when, when the game breaks apart against a team so poor you know but sometimes it's football right I suppose we didn't adapt to it we didn't adapt to what was on offer a little bit from a skulls point of view but again I'm saying this and, I, and I'm 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 always shouting at myself <laughs> to say, "Why are you saying that for? We just won our Old Trafford the second time in like two decades. We should be we should have the bunting out. Really, we should have it out." Yeah. Um. All right. Well, I think that wraps it for the game. Just quickly, Tim. Last thought on you know beating United at Old Trafford, but also the gap between these clubs. I mean, if I told you we'd be thirty points better than them. And they'd be bringing on kids we've never heard of at the final whistle. of 65 goals, I think it is, isn't it? In terms of goal difference now. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, it's it's crazy. And like the gulf between these two clubs right now is is an ocean. Now, we know that can close relatively quickly. But I mean, they signed this guy, Rasmus Hoyland, to be their line leading striker. He's not that guy. He's never The guy averages about a shot a game. Guess how many shots he had in this game? One shot. You know, he, he he looked very easy to contain. They have big money into guys like Anthony, who when he came on, we were relieved to see him come on. Up and coming players like Garnacho, who for me is still too raw to be the decisive player for a club of that stature. The guys that they relied on to get this performance over the, well, not over the line, but from not being a humiliation, Casemiro, he's done. Amrabat, not good enough. Johnny Evans, done. I know they have some players missing, but... The joy for me isn't just that we won at Old Trafford. The joy for me is taking a moment to look at how down and depressed and out of it they are and the chasm we've opened up between us. And I think when Ferguson retired and then ultimately when Wenger retired, I didn't feel particularly great about our trajectory versus theirs. And you look at it now and it just couldn't be better. And given what what I was raised on as an Arsenal person who came into Arsenal in the late 90s and 2000s, um, it, it's about the best thing I could possibly imagine to see them this far behind us, you know? Yeah, them, Chelsea, um, mm-hmm. you know, Spurs with the the kind of uh, existential anguish of needing to help us win the league to finish fourth. <laughs> like, as you know, I, I've said it before, but we've obviously been really caught up in this title race in the last couple of months, but there's been lots to enjoy and lots, um, lots to look back on and enjoy. I really, really like... Um, I, like I think Paul Merson has become a, a really, really good pundit in recent years, and he was on Sky. And uh, one of the reasons he's really good is because he just kind of cuts through the noise a little bit. Uh, and you'll enjoy the clip, Elliot, if you can mm. find it. Um, you may have already seen it, where he says, "Like, if Man U finish above Arsenal next season, I'll get a Man U tattoo." <laughs> I saw it. Yep, I saw it. It's it's fantastic. <laughs> and he's just like, and and he really cuts through it. And he he talked about like when Ten Hag talks, yeah, you almost like you almost kind of half fall asleep and think, yeah, actually maybe it's not too bad. And it's like, no, it's rubbish. It's awful. And it's, it's, it's wonderful. He, he knows he's cooked. I'm absolutely sure. And United getting a lot of criticism as well. Um, like their new owners because their women's team uh, won the FA cup at Wembley yesterday and nobody was there from Ineos. They're all at old Trafford, which is literally falling down, uh, looking like the apocalypse and, they're all sat there watching a men's game dead rubber and then getting, you know, it's pretty easy 1-0 in the end by this team who've just really overtaken them. And, you know, the last 15 years or so, we've had to sit back and we've had to watch some of these teams um, and it's been quite painful. So, yeah, I absolutely think we should take every opportunity to, to enjoy this because one of the things I think as well that should give us all a bit of perspective um, is as you get older, you appreciate the cycles of football more and you know there's going to be times when you're a bit crap and there are going to be times when you're good. And at the moment, we are in a cycle where we're good. And I don't want to be Captain Bringdown. It's not going to last forever. 
we are mm. going to have those cycles again where we're a bit crap. And so enjoy the hell out of this because it's great. Yeah, exactly. Exactly, exactly. Like, I don't know that I can tell someone to feel elation at a 1-0 victory where we weren't at our best against a terrible United, although you should feel it. You should, because it's still victory at Old Trafford uh, and their fans left wet and miserable and our fans left wet and happy. But I can tell you to feel elation at the remarkable chasm between these two clubs and how, quote, in the mud they are and how not in the mud we are. And it leaves us now in this really interesting position, Clive, as we wrap up here. The Tottenham Hotspur, who can never achieve anything, it seems, can achieve the most humiliating of accomplishments by getting a result over Manchester City that puts us on the doorstep of history. You know, you hear a lot of people say, I'll never root for Tottenham. I'll, I'm a real Arsenal man. I'll never root for Tottenham. Look, we could win the title next weekend. I'm rooting I am rooting for Tottenham, okay? That doesn't make me a non-Arsenal man. It makes me an Arsenal man who wants to win the title. City have a dreadful record there. The fans will not want them to win that game. But if Champions League is on the line, you cannot tell me that Ange and the club structure and the players will not want to go play Champions League football the next, next season. I don't buy that they will roll over. I just don't buy it. Because I, I think the thing that fans miss is that the players aren't fans. None of the Tottenham players are Tottenham fans. <laughs> they're, they're professional footballers with career pride. So what do you think? Do we, do we have a shot? I mean, the the record there from City suggests we have a shot. I think there's a lot of people assuming they'll roll over and get their tummy tickled. Do you connect it to what happens in the Villa Liverpool game? How do you think about Tuesday? Um, it's a tough one, right? Because it's lads, it, it's Tottenham, <laughs> right? So mm. you can't put your, you cannot trust this team, this club. Every time I've sort of looked at them and had wanted them to do well in the game because it's going to help us, they just lose. You know, that they just lose. and But of all the grounds that City have struggled in, this is the one they've struggled in the most. I don't think they've won here since 2019 or something like that, or 2018. Mm. Uh, I think if this was at any other time in the season, you'd think Spurs have got a chance. Oh, what Spurs knocked City out of the Champions League? It was an absolute travesty. Right? And they managed to get a result there. They've had... Big draws where they barely touched the ball. And they just have this Indian sign over C. But not now, not this week, because I just don't think they could I just don't think the players can do it to um to to their supporters, their own supporters, particularly if 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 Villa go and win. So um and I'm not hopeful. I'm not hopeful. The moment for City to lose it was probably Nottingham Forest. That was the one. Chris Wood standing leg, mate. Yo, he's, he's a problem for me. That was the moment. The moment they that City lost that penalty shootout against Real Madrid was a was a bad moment for mm -hmm. us in the league. That that focused mm -hmm. them. Trossard towing the cross against Villa when he, he normally side foots it, but he was a bit too keen and he towed it too close to the keeper. These are the moments, and we said yesterday on the IR. I hope we don't as a fan group, go back and look at these individual moments because that's a football season. You know, we have, if we go look at the bad moments, we need to look at Declan Rice header against Luton. We need to look at that. You know, we need to look at the deflected Martinelli goal against City. You know, Declan Rice of, against United. Yeah, Declan Rice against United. So if you're going to look at it all, Gabriel doing, doing the old... Um, matrix against united you know and stopping them going through and scoring right so um so yeah it all makes part of the season i suppose the, the one regret for me no i'm not gonna do it cause i said i wasn't gonna do it right so um <laughs> so yeah i'm not no but i'm not gonna do it because it doesn't matter because if we if you pick up if you pick up an extra point or two early in the season c would pick up an extra point or two as well you know so i think the big learning for me has been the addition of the champions league and what that has done, that oh, that that's the big learning. So now next year now, we need to recognise that we're going to be in that competition, hopefully towards the latter stages, and what it's going to do to our league run. And I think we need to we need to learn and adapt and be more efficient again to manage two competitions. So that was the new learning that maybe we weren't talking about in the preview start of the year. See, I think people are analysing Spurs wrong. It's not that you can't count on Spurs to win a game. 
That's not it. It's that you can count on Spurs to do the thing that will make their fans most miserable. That's what it is. That's the Kashani tweet, right? Whatever happens, the joke is always on Spurs. The joke would be on Spurs. In fact, let me carve this out for you. Liverpool beat Villa. Spurs beat City. Spurs qualify for the Champions League. By beating City, Spurs hand Arsenal the title. Next season, Arsenal knocks Spurs out of the Champions League that they handed us a title to qualify for. That's the Spursiest outcome possible. That's what we deserve um, and what they deserve, frankly. Tim, I won't ask you about the Spurs of it. I, I do feel strongly that that game is going to, if if not, look, I won't say that Spurs will get something. I, I looked at the betting odds. The betting odds have it as a 71% chance for a city to win. I'll take a 30% chance at the title yeah. right now. I'd take that. I think that game will be still in the balance late. Let me put it that way. I don't know that I think Spurs will get something, but I don't think it'll be a laugher. Having said that, um, what does it mean to you to have pushed the title to the final day? How how exciting is that for you? How much does it mean to you to go to the last, last game and know that at the worst, we'll be sitting there at the Emirates on a final day. We will not be wearing the new kit, by the way. We are not allowed to wear the new kit because if we win the title, we have to be in this season's kit. Ah, I didn't realize that. that we're not allowed to wear the new kit. Yep. Really? You um, are a so, font of knowledge, sorry, mate. Font of knowledge. Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> I know they want, they want to make that sweet, sweet money, but you're going to have to wait. Um, so we're going to be sitting there. Now, at worst, at worst, let's say the city blow out Spurs. At worst, we'll be sitting there checking the score of the other game. We'll have <laughs> something on the line. Hearts mm -hmm. of flutter. Now, I don't want to create heart palpitations too much. It's not out of the realm of possibility that Spurs and City draw and City are 4-0 up on West Ham at halftime, and we're nil-nil, <laughs> and they're ahead of us on goal difference. Like, it it could get that tight, right? So how excited are you for this to go to the final day? And, um, you know, for so many years, all we wanted was to be in it. Last season, we were in it not as long as we wanted. This season, we've gone right, right to the wire. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I think whatever happens, that experience will set this team in really good stead because, well, you know, whatever happens, they'll come out of it and say, let's let's do that again next year, lads. Let's, let's be in, in it on the final day again. Let's keep mm -hmm. having that kind of experience. And and yeah, for me, it's amazing. And, and also because of the goal difference thing where we've still got an advantage there, like knowing that a draw for City, like City don't have to lose necessarily, like that makes it more exciting as well, potentially. I mean, look, it could be like, you know, when we went to the Everton game two years ago and we needed Spurs <laughs> to not win at relegated Norwich and I think they were 4-0 up at half time mm -hmm. and you just go, oh, okay, all right, that's over then, isn't it? Um, but yeah, it's, it's. I think, I, I really do, I think it's a landmark for this team. I really, like... I, I really desperately wanted that. I really desperately wanted that. That feels like, even if we're not going to win it, that feels significant to me. And I guess like circling it back to this game a bit, I almost feel like this game might have more value next season. So like that, that record at Old Trafford thing is no longer a thing. I don't think mm. that's what was in their minds. But, but next year when they go there and we're much better than Man United again, and maybe they do have Fernandez and Rashford if he's still there and, you know, they'll probably be able to turn out a better team. I do think there's a value that we've, we've gone and done this now so that that, that shouldn't be an issue anymore. Um, but yeah, like, like for me that the landmarks now to tick off next season, other than actually winning the league, obviously are, you know, winning at Anfield, winning at the Etihad. Those are the only grounds now where we haven't done it yet, um, really under Arteta. Like, we've ticked the other ones off now, and we've beaten those teams at home. So can we go and beat them away next season? But I, I'm I'm just, I'm so happy um, that there's something on it on, on the final day. And I, I, you know, I'm confident that, you know, Everton at home, when they've got nothing to play for, like, we can't ask for much more than that as a fixture um either so I, I i just it feels it feels fitting um to me for this team that like they the, i think this team deserves to win the league i think they're the best team in the country i think they've been the best team in the country um and and i think the minimum that they deserve is that there are two trophies <laughs> that the premier league has to go and make a replica 
and that it will it will be in our ground um, on the final day of the season. I, I think that's um, that that's a big marker of progress for this team because they couldn't handle the run in last year. They've handled it this year, pending um, obviously the result of the Everton game. You've just given me the absolute terror at thinking that the Premier League trophy is going to be at the Emirates on Sunday. <laughs> It really is up for grabs now, as they say. Um, well, we are, look, we're right where we wanted to be. In the summer when we were doing our predictions, it, it, it's actually interesting. I mean, you know what's crazy, guys? I was looking at the Predictatron. I had us winning the title with 88 points. And most people said that my predictions of Arsenal results were way too rosy. We're probably on pace to exceed my prediction, and still are not favorites to win the league. I mean, you know what I mean? It's just, it's incredible. And I think, you know, Mikel had a quote that some people liked, some people hated when they asked him, you know, is this progress? He said, 27 wins, most in our, our club history in Premier League. It's not hi- progress, it's history. And, you know, I mean, I get it. There's some people like, no, it's it's not history if you don't go on and win the title. But I think in the age of, in the age of, Manchester City, I think it's okay to to celebrate the history you're creating. Um, of course, we all want to go on and and win the title and win the big trophies. But yeah, it's just it's so interesting. And in fact, if I look back at at the Predictatron and I look at where you know where the points came for each team, I had City finishing on 87 points. I had them dropping points to Fulham, which they clearly didn't do. I had them getting one point against Arsenal. I had us getting 88 points. I had them dropping two points to Tottenham. So we'll see. If they if they do that, we'll see. Clive, I just want to point out that you had City getting 83 points, and um, I would <laughs> I would certainly take that because right now we would be toasting to the title that we have How many points won. did I have for Arsenal? How many points did I have for Arsenal? 86. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, it's funny. They're going to exceed all our expectations and predictions, and it still may not be enough. But we we live in hope, and we take it to the final day, and that's all we can ask for. We'll leave it there. We will have um, pods for you all week. Tim and Clive are going to do a one-club pod, which is our our women's pod. There's some big news that's come out. Viv, Miedema leaving Arsenal. So um, definitely be some discussion around that and and other things that we're going to do this week. We'll have lots of fun in-person stuff that we're doing as well. We just look forward to sharing all that with you. And thanks for being on this journey that goes to the final day. And and maybe, maybe just maybe something really, really special uh, within the next week for us to be celebrating. Tim's on Twitter at Stominator. Thanks, Tim. My pleasure as always. Clive's on Twitter at Clive PFC. Thanks, Clive. Thank you very much. My name is Alex Smith. You can block me on Twitter at Yankee Gunner. We love you. I apologize in advance for saying this. We will talk to you after Tottenham 10, City Nil. No.